uh, refreshing or maybe out of the refrigerator, they will do a chicken coop, who knows, but don't discard anything or postpone it as long as possible. We manufacture, uh, again, when we are offered a remanufactured thing, our first reaction is, well, it was a damaged thing and now I'm buying a second hand. No, remanufacturing is bringing it back as new. Uh, so uh, all the specs, the functionality, the, the aspect, uh, uh, it, it's still there. Um, and then recycle form. Recycle, again, we are adding a lot of materials and a lot of energy and a lot of transportation when we get to recycling. Um, and, and this is, uh, again, is familiar with the model and probably many of you are, but this is a very uh, good and uh, you know, very uh, nicely and clearly designed model of what a circular economy is with two different branches. Uh, one is the technical side, which are the artifacts, the things that we create that we don't find in nature, uh, but called the uh, technical nutrients or technical materials, and the biological materials, those that we find in nature or those that we use nature to produce, like all our crops. Um, and you see also how they are also recommending that we try to postpone landfilling. If it's, at some point it's impossible, everything degrades, but the question is does it degrade after 10 years, 100 years, or after a month? Uh, and the fact that we can, we can burn waste, again, should be of no consolation, because that has other bad aspects. So what we should try again, keep things in these circles, and the closer the circle, the better off if we are. Why? Because we keep it very close to its usage. We don't need to transport it very far away for recycling, and we don't need to add uh, um, energy in that circle. Um, again, we won't dwell a lot on, on any particular uh, slide or, or graph because uh, you will have the materials at your disposal, and then please ask us questions. And then next time we'll know what to emphasize for for the, the, the next event. Um, again, this is not new. There, there have been engineers who have been thinking, at least on the manufacturing side, uh, about this for a long time, where they see they have been talking since the 90s, the 80s or 70s about non-linear way of doing things. But who, who is listening? This has uh, been uh, created in academia, it stayed in academia. However, uh, I think we maybe can confirm, now it's, it's, becoming, it's becoming quite important uh, in, uh, in many academic and in also in practice. So from being a niche uh, subject, it's, it's becoming uh, mainstream. So I'm convinced that the people who are educated nowadays at any level uh, are much more familiar with this system, at, at least with the idea that we shouldn't be wasting the new willy really, and we should be careful on how we design, how we make uh, things so they're uh, durable and we don't uh, waste them. Uh, but I, I just like to, to praise the engineers like me that they're not all dumb and just making products one after another for the sake of making money for the finance team and for the shareholders, they are thinking about these things. Um, and uh, a little bit about how I put all this together in the context of what we need to be careful is not to affect anymore the Earth's uh, biogeochemical uh, bio and hydrological cycles, which is exactly what we've been doing for 200 years. And we're, we're now into a difficult situation where all these uh, feedbacks are coming back to, to harm us. Um, and it, it's not such a big deal. You know, we've been living for a long time in balance with, with nature. We just have to go back to that while finding technologies and uh, way of organizing our activities uh, that allow us to still be a very advanced economy and still make progress. Again, I'm, I'm talking about planes, of course, I hate flying nowadays, it's a, it's a horror, 
But how about if we get solar plane? By the way, there is a company flying around a solar uh, plane. Um, so then, no, then I'm okay. I'm not. I do not have, and none of us will have a negative impact through the, the advanced way of transportation. Um, and uh, so what we need to do is to reduce and eliminate the use of uh, materials or energy sources that are virgin, that we destroy the earth to get to them, uh, that are not renewable, that are socially bad uh, or toxic, and uh, do vice versa with, uh, with the uh, opposite. Um, and again, keep in mind all the time that uh, there are certain uh, key elements, uh, chemical elements, that are vital to life. This is how life uh, uh, appeared and how we maintain it. And it's exactly all of these cycles that we have uh, uh, affected negatively with the way we operate uh, nowadays. So uh, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, uh, sulfur, we should always think of them in whatever activity we're involved. We all know agriculture, what impact uh, uh, it has uh, on, on the usage of this element, on imbalancing the, the uh, cycles of these particular elements. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, we should uh, uh, change the way we do things that we keep uh, uh, within uh, one Earth capacity because it might be fun to think that we'll move to Mars, but that ain't going to happen. Uh, so we have only one Earth where we know that life is possible. We have to uh, take care of it. Uh, how am I doing? Uh, Time. Um, another very important uh, aspect, circular economy, some people view it uh, um, as just a, a change in the global economy. So where you, where you will make these things uh, uh, and these changes will not matter. Our position is that localization is fundamental to the success of this uh, new framework. So even if we use only renewable energy for transportation, we should always think about what is happening at the local level. Do people have jobs? Do people have the good jobs? Uh, are we using the local cultural uh, characteristics? Uh, and never think only about how cheap something is, but how was it made, under which environmental conditions, under which social conditions, and let's you know, every locality take care of itself. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we don't want other, other people to be prosperous. On the contrary, we want everybody to be prosperous, and we want everybody to live under the same uh, demanding uh, environmental and social conditions that we have here. Uh, because it doesn't help us. So uh, the fact that we, we, we all experience it, the fact that we have moved our manufacturing in, in countries that have no environmental standards, uh, again, it's irrelevant for the, all that pollution comes back to hurt us. So we have just not only outsourced uh, the labor, but we outsourced our environmental and social well-being. Uh, and I think that's another thing that we should keep in mind every time we make a purchase. Um, I can tell you I am a very, very uh, discomforting uh, a buyer. Uh, I make everybody run around in the store to show me where things are made. Uh, and they have to waste hours to find the label, to, to find if it's written where it's made. And if it's not made in the States, I don't buy it. I'm not saying that that is the solution. Uh, but it, it is an important thing, meaning that when I do a purchase, the first thing I think about is not the price and if I can get the lowest. Can I get the quality that I want? First of all, do I really need it or I buy it just to have fun? Uh, do I really need it? And then who made it? Am I helping somebody else with the object or, or even more important with the food uh, that I'm buying? And I think. This change will happen not only uh, us uh, getting together and agreeing that we'll make this transformation at a, at a larger scale, but very much at individual uh, scale because it's not so it's not so difficult to care a little bit more uh, in the way we uh, purchase uh, things. Uh, so you have heard uh, in the video the notion of symbiosis. Uh, we, 
this is how we operated before. Almost everything was linked uh, uh, locally and people still did satisfy their needs and some. Uh, but you know, at some point we, we took a turn and we decided that let's go and always find uh, uh, scale. So you know, uh, I'll make everything in one place because this is how a corporation can make it cheaper. Um, we were talking about the carrier situation in, in uh, uh, Indianapolis while uh, we're driving here. Uh, so you, you just you know, uproot your, your, your plant and go without any concern about what that does uh, for the local community. And the local community did build that plant, right? Um, so we should, we should uh, uh, try all the time to find local resources. If they don't exist, let's create them. Uh, another uh, important advantage of having a, a local uh, network is that we're going to match much better than <laughs> demand because not, no transformation will work like us consuming less stuff, less stuff of anything. Uh, at local level, like for, for, for city foods, it's much easier to understand local demand, okay? In a month I'm selling so much, in a year I'm selling so much of, of all of these. I don't need to make a volume 10, ten times more. You, you can match much better and uh, understand much better uh, local demand if you make and provide things uh, locally. Um, and. Uh, Let's try to, uh, which is what we're trying to do through this event, create these, these local networks, create these connections. So after we, we leave today, try to get in touch with each other and with, with us, uh, obviously, because we're trying to build this network, both at local level and then at uh, uh, state level. And in the end, make it work. So we prove, we prove it by doing it. Um, and all of these uh, ties, what? Through transport and through uh, money. Uh, we're not going to talk much about uh, uh, money today, but uh, one of the sessions will we'll look at how we finance all this and we'll have to answer the question, are we making money out of it? Uh, otherwise, again, people are not going, everybody needs to, to make a living and a good living. So, uh, and fortunately, there are a lot of examples that, uh, uh, yes, people are making uh, money with this new uh, model. Um, and uh, we want to show you some examples of people, uh, let me think a little bit. Um, but before that, uh, do you have any questions or uh, examples of, or other things that you want to share with us? Well, you know, there's this mantra that's just been kind of going around over the last five, six years that when it's up, reduce, reuse, recycle. <laughs> and that kind of sounds like what you're talking about, but it's really neat the examples that you've given with the manufacturing symbiosis. But uh, reduce just you just don't need all of that, whatever that that is, and uh, and then reuse. That's the fun part, the creative fun part. What can I do with the rest of the zinc plant? And uh, and then recycle. And uh, the recycle, me and it really hit home when you said about the trucks that come get those recycled things. Where is all that stuff going? So um, it just reminded me of that that particular mantra. I'm sure. You all used it and heard it. Reduce, reuse, recycle. One of the one of the problems with oh, well, recycle it is that it, it still keeps that waste approach. You know, we're still throwing things away yeah. and still making real, it out of things that can't even be recycled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so where does it go? You know, one of the we live in Bloomington, and one of the things was where really is we just recently yeah. learned that waste management picks up our recyclables. We don't really know where it's going. Is it really being recycled? You know, it's kind of like going to tear a hole where the landfill is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we had, we had a giant landfill by where we grew up. They they turned it into a golf course. For so. you. So it's yeah, exactly. But, but all this stuff that we don't need to have in the first place, and then you say, well, we need stuff. We still need stuff. One of the examples I, I was able to uh, hear Ellen MacArthur in person 
talk, her favorite example is the washing machine. And she said, why do we need to own the washing machine? We still need a washing machine. We can rent it and it be designed so that at the end of its life, the manufacturer still owns it and takes it back, takes all the pieces back so it can be refigured to the newer version. But we never had to dispose of it. It went back so that design function, the design part is really critical to this. So it's not just kind of an idea go in that circle. That's really nice and pleasant. But what are the realities? It has to start really early on in design. If that's in agriculture, if that's in a process where we're running a service, you know, that whole idea of what impacts are we having all through the life of a product. I have a question. Yeah. Are, do you have very many people interested in tiny homes, tiny houses? In your one? Okay. I've been researching them for quite a while. I kind of want to go live in the woods. Well, I don't necessarily want to live in the woods, but I've been researching them for a long time. And they're very interesting. And I, don't, I didn't know if you had anybody else in your... Well, that could be a whole nother session. You know, we could do uh, living, you know, people's uh, modes of living as, as sustainable. You know, if you look... Yeah, because it's very difficult right now to get them um, with government to get them um, zoned to where you can. Really because right there's a lot of red tape. Like in a factory just to survive. Yeah. Well, so I think one of my questions is, um, or things that I think about, is if we start, if we reduce our consumption, that reduces the amount of transactions, economic activity. If we have less transactions, we're producing less. We need less people making things. And so, how do we how do we create high value jobs and create enough of them? Um, because I think there's a very strong possibility that as things become more higher, high tech, more expensive to manufacture, more automated, you're, you're going to get the the, wealth, the extremely wealthy are going to more and more not need the lower class to actually, you know, do anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah I guess my point is similar to this point. The uh, there's a prequel to the issue of economy, and I think that prequel is about relationships. And what really does it mean to be human? And, and what are the values? Wash machines that are sold are not sold because they wash machines well. I mean, wash clothes well. They're sexy. They're sold to the idea that you have a particular kind of machine, a particular kind of vehicle, live in a particular place. That says something about what, what it means for you to be human. So we now live in a global culture that's driven around the idea that to be human means that you consume certain kinds of trinkets that then gives value to your existence. So your so our relationships with each other globally and locally have been tied to the idea that value is not about my relationship with you, but about what I own, what I acquire. So the dilemma that you present is a real dilemma, that if we change our value system, it says, oh, I don't need to consume all of that. It has a direct and immediate impact on the economy. And uh, that's one reason now we see this huge amount of wealth being uh, uh, consolidated in a handful of families globally. So I think at some point in these conversations about the economy and certainly economy, which I'm a full supporter of, uh, the idea of bringing back into our dialogue and our discourse what does it mean to be human? So at the end of my day, if I can count, instead of how much money I've made, how I have impact others through giving, then my quotient for being human has gone up. You know, our profit and loss statement has gone off the charts by what I've given to others who then give to others and then increases that. So um, I think at some point we have to begin to try to have that conversation talked about local economy, you know, we work and, and live, and when we do get a chance to play uh, in a predominantly African-American community, uh, a heavily, uh, quote unquote, impoverished community, if we're measuring wealth through the lens of, of 
material resources. It is a community high in social capital, high in cultural capital that does not have the same kind of value in this economy we live in. But in our community, Indianapolis, black on black homicide is highest in the nation, the whole country. And uh, the solutions that are being looked at are, are the same historical solutions, increased public safety, in other words, more police, uh, blame the victim, you know, you guys are on doing too much drugs, et cetera, et cetera, and not looking at how do we return a sense of what it means to be human and make contributions to it. So my last comment as I look at it, and the challenge, we're going to leave about 3.30, but the challenge I'd like to present to this group and others is, particularly here in the U.S. and others, the question of race, class, and gender. Uh, still not something that we've embraced talking about uh, and figuring out how do we make sure others are included in these, these discourses. Um, uh, so that as this new economy, the new economy will come into being without those tools because humans naturally uh, do things in a sustainable way when they're human. You know, this, this idea of being sustainable is an ancient phenomenon with human beings. This, these advanced economies would have led to the, the global collapse of the planet and, and the, the danger of not being able to exist any longer. But I, I think the tools are critical to the change. But the most important thing is that we work on our relations with each other, try to figure out how to remove those barriers that have moved us away from that humanity. And uh, through that, I think all of us are creating us and oh, here's a better way for us to do these kind of things. So that's, I support this. I'm looking forward to continuing working with it. But if we can figure out how to, to, to drive that piece into this discourse, so we, at the end of the day, we're still saying, what we're trying to really do at the end of the day is not even about economy as we see it. It's more about how do we live on, on a finite planet with each other and sustain the planet and the other living beings on the planet. So that's my takeaway. Absolutely. And, and the reason this concept still uses the economy is because that's what everybody is fascinated about. How often do you hear the word society or community or humanity? It's all about economy. So, okay, if this is what we need to, to use in order to convince people to change things at a systemic level, we'll use the circular. Well, economy. I agree with that. I would just encourage to include ideas like social capital, oh, a form of wealth, cultural capital, another form of wealth, it even relationship capital. So as we talk about economy, yeah, use the language of the present. Figure out ways to expand that that then allows us to put these other ideas into that model as we redefine it. Because at the end of the day, if we create a local economy that's still exclusive, that's still just only serving our own small tribe and have not addressed this other inequity, you know, what, what have we accomplished? Only I think it's more difficult for a local economy because it's small, in the end it has to, you have to have everybody as a customer or as a producer in that local economy. And Evan, it, it's really a difficult question, right? It's not that there is a clear answer. But it is pretty obvious that much more money is being kept locally if the, mm -hmm. the local economy is prosperous. Mm -hmm. Look at our big urban, you know, successful urban places. They have their own economy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and uh, we should, another thing that we need to think of, like I mentioned, to value the repairman as much as the guy who makes a new thing at the factory nearby, or more so because he keeps value. But for, for that, so I don't know, is the a shoe repair shop uh, here nearby? Yeah. Excellent. Go and patronize them. City food, right? The money that comes here doesn't go into the big box grocery stores. We, they, we'll, we'll show you an example about the micro manufacturing and how things are going with smaller and smaller manufacturing. A lot of people will restart doing their own things, whether it's, uh, uh, it, it's food or product, and again, they're going to make rather things that we need. And what better thing? to think of is food, because we make, like you said, uh, a lot of trinkets, but we don't know how to make uh, uh, fundamental, to satisfy our fundamental needs. 
and, and financially it's been poor. Think about it, nothing will be traded on Wall Street out of these uh, small uh, uh, shops, small producers. Mm. But they might be traded locally. And fortunately, there, there are a lot of changes now in financial rules. And again, we won't talk about that, but at one session we will talk only about the financing of this thing. Uh, because we want rather first to build up the values, the, you know, to critique this system so we don't just on the topic because somebody, some foundation says it's great. Uh, it, we need to make it work for us, for everybody else, and for everybody else in, in the future. There will be a lot of new jobs and there will also be, I think, much more uh, universal kind of working. So I'm not going to work uh, in an assembly line. Or like we, we already talked, right? Because the moment they uh, shut it down, you're out. Maybe we will also work one day per week in agriculture. Because we shouldn't be happy that only 2% of our population works in agriculture. Well, when they will decide not to work in agriculture, none of us will know how to make food. Uh, and, and that's a disaster. Right, or there is no transfer of knowledge between generations in agriculture. And I'm the last person to talk about that because I don't know how to make uh, uh, agriculture. <laughs> but I'm a big admirer. I, I, did it, I, I, I have an idea and I understand how hard work it is. So I will never look for cheap food. I don't, I don't think that is possible to make cheap food. I, I think you're point about the social component, the social capital is really critical. And bringing things more to a local level, looking at from the standpoint of the city government, the town government, needs to be a critical voice at the table when you start talking about this. It's, it's starting, I think, at a grassroots level is a really good place to start with individuals, producers of food, producers of services that want to keep it local. But also bringing that the government to the table, bringing the NGOs in a, in a community to the table, and having that discussion of how do we solve that issue. There's no, there's no pattern for us to go to and say, this is going to fit and work here, but kind of a discussion. And I think you raise a really good point about what makes people happy in a city. When, when people say, I want to move to so-and-so, or this is just a lovely place to live. Why is it a lovely place? because I feel at home here, I have things to do, I, have friends. I feel included. So what are those success factors that make something that kind of a place? Uh, and again, each place is going to be different, but I think you raise a very good point. And I think that's a challenge that we should all think about. It's not just the jobs, you know, well, let's create jobs and everybody will come. Well, that's not enough, you know, obviously. But it's, it's a more, uh, let's look at all three aspects, economic, environmental, social, as equally important. But as we start to describe the circular economy, it is based on a you know, tangible thing. We're looking at the product, whether it be food, whether it be a, a washing machine, and designing it so that there's no waste. And that means no waste of people. But also keeping people employed. You know, that more of a service economy, more of a repair, more of a providing those kinds of jobs um, that kind of economic activity, also looking at the social part of it too. So. And I'm, just, I'm challenged, you know, that, and I'll continue to raise this as we move forward collectively together, that those who have been left out, who are still left out, will continue to be left out mm -hmm. if we're not talking about that and driving it on the front end. What do we need to do to ensure? This one last very little, before we came today, we met with the vice principal of a local charter school that recently moved to the neighborhood, caused a big commotion because folks felt that their school had been taken over by outsiders looking to gentrify the neighborhood. And the vice principal, one of our students attends school there, uh, the vice principal reached out and invited him over. And the reach out about, look, we've got a problem here, we want to be good neighbors in the community, how can we work together? And um, so we said, yeah, okay, let's sit down and let's figure it out. Tied to the idea of urban agriculture and some other kinds of components. But that's a one particular leader who recognized they have a problem in their community and decided, I'm going to go over and talk to some folks that may not even want to talk to me and see if we can figure out how to move our communities forward together. That has to be an integral part of the discourse on the front end. 
Otherwise, those who have been locked out, you know what they're going to say about this? Okay, I know yeah. folks ain't getting ready to do nothing. We saw this before 30 years ago. We saw it before 50 years ago. Even now, last week with Bernie. I'm a supporter of Bernie Sanders. A lot of people in our community are not going to support Bernie. They don't believe it. There's no trust. So how will we get to a new economy if we haven't built community relationships? I say, I, I can get on the phone and call you and trust that even if I don't agree with you, trust that what you're going to be honest and authentic with me in our relationship. It has to be on the front end. It can't be after the fact. Because if we do it after the fact, we're going to be safe. Uh, to speak to a local business and its its part in making a solution just a little bit, uh, Main Street employs 80% uh, of the world's population or the world's workforce and Wall Street uh, employs 20%, but yet the economics are reversed where Wall Street represents 80% of the world's financial value and uh, Main Street only represents 20%. Um, so local businesses tend to pay higher, have better job satisfaction, have better job retention, and also be better uh, philanthrop philanthropic players in their communities. And I think that it's that act of grounding, uh, just like uh, Imhotep just said, about uh, really having connections in community and, and that at authentic social capital. And then in terms of what they can actually shift, uh, when you look at... Uh, the ability for uh, small business and, and Main Street to uh, perhaps enforce uh, new standards on its suppliers, that's very much something that, that can be done. And when you have you know, p potentially 80% of the workforce in a situation where, yeah, they're economically excluded in many respects uh, by a system that's just kind of casino economics, on the other hand, they can start to hold some standards to their suppliers and, and, and create some accountability where maybe there hasn't really been the opportunity to do that before. It's not somebody that nobody knows where he is or cares. And you don't have so many suppliers. That's also the beauty of the system. You don't need tier 1,000 suppliers, which we all know where they are, right? Uh, it's all about cheap labor and horrible uh, working conditions. I have only two tiers of suppliers, and they're all in the greater Lafayette area, or they're all in Indiana. You know, I'm not saying that every